Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Hi, Mike Anderson here with the GoTo Book Club, and I'm here to talk with James Higginbotham, a fantastic author that I've had the opportunity to work with a few times and known for several years. James is an executive API consultant at Launch NE, his experience with API strategy, software architecture, training teams, and API and microservice design. And James guides enterprises through their digital transformation journey, ensuring alignment between business and technology through product-based thinking to deliver great customer experience. James, it's so good to be talking with you again. How you doing? Great, Mike. Thanks for thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. And we're here to talk about your book, Principles of Web API Design. Um, I love the book. You know, uh, buyer beware. I, I read early copies, early drafts, and I was uh, happy to write a forward for the book. So uh, I really, really enjoy it very much. Um, the first question I'm just going to ask on this on this is why write this book? Books are huge. Books are big investments. What uh, what prompted you or motivated you or or goaded you into do, doing this book? Yeah. So so the reason I, I wrote the book, I, I've been uh, helping organizations for nearly a decade now uh, to uh, understand how to approach their API programs and to design APIs that are delivering or that are designed to deliver a great developer experience. And so through the workshops I've delivered and the time I've spent helping people with designing APIs and designing their API program, uh, I wanted to be able to capture all of that that I've learned and share that with others so that everybody can benefit from the insights that I've had an opportunity to, to gain over the last decade. Yeah, you know, one of the things uh, that I really love about the book is, is while it's focused on, you know, web design and design in the real sense, I love how you start out early on talking about digital capabilities and business alignment. That's one of the key elements in your in your process. It goes all through the the experience, including documentation and portals and change management over time. So this is this is a this is a thing that I really love. All these experiences sort of add up to what design is like, design in the bigger sense. And, and I think that's that makes the book a bit unusual in that sense. So I, I, I really love that. And what I also think is really, really cool is that this book is part of the Vaughn Vernon signature series, this Addison Wesley series. And this is this is heady stuff. I mean, how did you how how did that work out? Because because, you know, Vaughn is known for his uh, his uh enterprise architecture stuff. How did you two meet and how did this uh, this uh, arrangement work out? Yeah, so Vaughn and I have known each other for a while, but really this whole journey started when he sent me a direct message on Twitter and said, you know what, we should work together on something. We're working on similar things. He was working and has been developing a framework for some time that's a reactive framework to help people design software by applying domain-driven design principles and also to help support this, you know, growth in microservices that have been out for a while. So he has this framework called Vlingo. And he said, look, I've been working on that for a while. I've been teaching on DDD for a while. But, you know, you're focused in on APIs. I'd love to sit down and talk about how can Vlingo support APIs? You know, how does that framework need to think about APIs? And so I started sharing a bit about what I coach teams on, the perspective I came in from. And he had mentioned to me that he had the signature series starting. And I thought, wow, that's going to be great for DDD fanatics. And, 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 you know, getting deeper and deeper, he has the, the two books already that he's written, uh, or, or three now, I think, just focused on DDD purely. 
But over time, what we ended up talking about was that his signature series was going to go beyond DDD and that he really wanted to have a book that would talk about API design in there. So I shared with him some of the, the work I'd done before and the perspective and, and, a, and a, you know, a table of contents of what I would see going into it. So it just took off from there. Uh, it's not unlike when I first uh, authored my first book for Q Publishing back in 96, 97 with Jeff Schneider. It's called Using Enterprise, uh, Using Enterprise Java. And it was one of the first Enterprise Java books that came out before Enterprise Java or J2E had even been announced in 99 mm -hmm. at Java 1. So there, I, I kind of stumbled into it the same way where Jeff sat down and said, hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? And and here it was, you know, years and years later, Vaughn comes to me and says, have you ever thought about writing a book about web API design? It would fit great in the series. So it's, it's just been fantastic. Vaughn's a great series editor. He has really a, a heart for helping developers and giving the author the freedom to tell the story, to get that narrative out. And, and Addison Wesley has been great, too, to give us that flexibility to write the right number of pages, not write a lot of filler, get right to the meat of the problem, and to deliver something that's of really just high value to developers and non-developers alike. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, that's one of the things I notice in, in, in the book as well. And we talked about this when I was doing the review. It is a, it's a dense it's a dense book. I mean, it's, it's a good read. I really enjoy it very much and I keep it, I keep it handy quite often. In fact, I, you know, uh, folks should know that I've ended up helping teach some, uh, teach some of this material from this book with you uh, a couple of times. And I just, I love working with it. Uh, you've got this real, uh, real keen sense. Uh, and it's not just enterprise level, but all sorts of levels about sort of drilling into the things that really, really matter. And, and that's one of the things that, I wanted to make sure we talked about when we, when we got together was your, your, your key organizing principle around the book, which you call ADDR. Um, I, I, I hesitate to ask it, but can you sort of in a nutshell or sort of in a short way sort of explain what ADDR is and why you, why you use that as your sort of guiding principle? Yeah, let me see if I can summarize this quickly. So ADDR stands for align, define, design, refine. It's the four phases that anyone really goes through when they're designing an API. They may not be consciously thinking about it, but they're starting or should be starting with going from the requirements. What is it that the API needs to do and aligning on that, but not just on technical requirements, but also the business requirements, product requirements. And then we evolve that into a definition of what the API needs to do. And then we apply the right API style or styles during the design phase. And then we use Refine to spend a lot of time to get feedback. We recognize uh, that we do need to write a lot of code and that sometimes we can do this work in parallel or we can do it iteratively, but we also have to recognize that APIs are forever. Um, uh, the, the fact that once we establish a contract, this isn't like, you know, this isn't like code, an API for some code, and it's in a shared library in the organization. And if we refactor to make a change and we coordinate with a few internal developers, we can make a breaking change or we can uproot something completely and swap things out. Uh, and it's not something where we can just run some unit tests and integration tests and determine where we broke things. We have most often consumers of our APIs that are outside our organization or outside our control. So our contracts are gonna be fixed. We can add to them, we can enhance them, but we can't break them. Uh, or at least we don't want to do that. We don't wanna deliver that kind of poor experience. So the ADDR process is really designed to help people go from requirements to an API design they can feel confident finalizing the code for. Doesn't mean you can't code in parallel or do some, you know, um, prototypes to mitigate risk or explore some aspect of the technical solution. But we do want to be careful not to just start writing code and delivering an API that we haven't thought about the design for and then uh, create a lot of breaking changes because we have to go back and make last minute changes. Uh, or, you know, quick, fa fast follow on changes. Sure. And, and, and that, again, that's one of the things that really stands out in, in the book itself. And I'm way I've seen you teach the material as well. This sort of business alignment as the starting place. I think you do a fantastic job with that. And, uh, one of the things that comes out, one of the, one of the devices, uh, and, and we, we've talked about this a couple of times, uh, through our careers. We all have some kind of way of approaching this. I love your idea of job stories. 
uh, the way that you, you sort of, this is one of the key assets that you kind of put together, right? Which is a little bit like a user story, a little bit like an API story, but you call it a job story. Can you sort of expound on like, where did that come from? How, how does that work out? And, and how does that, you know, be a part of this uh, ADDR process? Yeah, job stories. I didn't invent job stories, but I definitely took advantage of them because I, for me, it's the right tool to apply at the right time. Uh, job stories are rooted in the jobs to be done concept that Clayton Christensen introduced years ago. And he, he introduced uh, and built upon a few concepts from the 80s. One of them was voice of the customer. How do we design a product that represents the needs of the customer, not just the needs of the business building or delivering the product or service? And he, he framed that in the position of jobs to be done. What is the job to be done? And he did this from the idea of or in helping coaching startups. If I'm a startup and I'm trying to figure out how do I go to market and start to get traction quickly, it's not that I'm bringing some new whiz bang feature or technology or anything to the market. It's that there's a job to be done because of a problem that exists. A problem exists. I want the solution or the outcome, a certain outcome to, to be the case solve the problem, you know, get into this positive position or, or address this issue, move on. So in that gap in the middle is the job to be done. And that's where any organization, startup, individual or large enterprise can start to think about what is that job and how am I going to go offer a product or a service that's going to solve that. So I, lo- I, I when I started seeing that and I bumped across Alan Clement's job stories, which is a way to to frame the job to be done in a repeatable way, it creates this very thoughtful, easy to use framework that frames things a bit different than the way our industry has used uh, user stories traditionally, where we're as right. I, I want to, uh, you know, so I can or something like that, some sort of uh, template like that, where it tends to be more feature centric. This really helps us to step above that, get in there beforehand and start empathizing with those that are, in this case, going to be using our APIs. So we write this uh, when, you know, what's the triggering event? Uh, I want to, what's the job to be done? So I can, what's the outcome? And if we center everything on that outcome, then everything that we do for our API design, for the solutions that we build, any UIs that we build, anything else, uh, they'll center on that outcome. And so it's a great way to align also our APIs with teams that are performing UX. So anybody doing UX work, they're thinking about jobs to be done. So now we're starting to align with other team members that may not be necessarily involved directly in the API, but are going to be involved in the solution and start to think about how our API is going to help move that forward, deliver that job to be done so that it can be automated or integrated in a mobile web app, whatever we have, and then to accomplish or produce that outcome. So that's that's where we like to start from. And it's a great way to talk about things without talking about HTTP and all those technical details when we have the stakeholders in the room. So we can have business, we can have product, and we have tech all talking about the same thing. Yeah, I think that's the thing that really, really struck me when I when I saw the way you were using it in the process. And that is, before we talk about uh, solutionizing, I think I've heard you say this phrase before, before we talk about solving the problem, let's make sure we're defining it really, really well. And you, you've got a line in the book. I actually had to, I had to pull it out because I really love it. Teams want to have the confidence that the API they plan to deliver meets the stakeholders needs. I think that's a wonderful way to just home right in on. That's another kind of empathy, right? It's like, let's, let's make sure that the teams know this is what's really needed. This is what's really wanted. And the job stories can really can really help that. I love I love that line. I think the other thing that comes to mind when you talk about Clement and you talk about Christensen is the Poppendieks, Tom and Mary Poppendiek. You know, she's got this great thing about uh, the biggest mistake is is not building it wrong, but building the wrong thing, like building the thing that's not really needed. So I love that you're you're really able to use job stories a, as part of this. Um, now, job stories start to sound a little like another thing that you talk about in the book, um, event storming. Um, But they're really sort of a different approach, right? They're really sort of different things, but they have kind of the same goal. Is that right? I mean, do I I get that right? Are they in in the same league or something? They do, yeah. So in the line phase, I encourage several things. One is to 
have that customer empathy so that we can start mapping by mapping out our job stories and we can start thinking about our API from those outcomes, not just moving data around or connecting system A to system B. Uh, th there's two other tools that I recommend. One is to take job stories and break them down into activities and steps. So what are the sequence of steps required to get us to that outcome? So now we, we know the outcome, what it is, and we know the job to be done, how do we break that job into smaller increments? So I, I recommend that, and that's built upon business process engineering or BPE that's been around for years. So it's just simply taking those steps and breaking them down. There are times then when sometimes things are uncertain and we're not quite sure where things need to go. That's where event storming comes in. So event storming is not really like a brainstorming activity as much as it's a, an exploration, uh, communication and alignment technique. Traditionally, it's done in person in a, on a big wall with a big sheet of paper and lots of sticky notes and pens and everybody's contributing and putting things up and moving things around. Uh, but it's really a framework that lets us think in different levels. It lets us think at a, at a big, big idea or big picture level. What's the big idea of the whole solution or product that we're trying to do, as well as what are the smaller ideas? What are the steps? What are the events we're producing? What are the commands we're sending? So it kind of blends some of the ideas of DDD, but in a way that we can have non-technical people in the room, our subject matter experts, our domain experts, to all talk about this. So when, when things aren't clear and we either can't figure out what the job stories are or we figured out the job stories, but we're not quite sure what those activity steps are that our API is going to need to power digitally, then I recommend using event storming. And so there's a section in the book that talks about it. It's uh, not to, not meant to replace uh, Brandolini's book by any means, but meant to kind of summarize how would you use it in the context of ADDR to surface up those things that your API is going to need to do and, and also to find other aspects and elements and fill in the gaps of your API. So it's, it's used, um, you know, I've used it a lot around the world. I've trained other people on how to use it in my way, uh, just like Brandolini has done and others have done in their way. So there's, it's a lighter weight version of what Brandolini offers specifically for helping to kind of narrow down the scope of the, of the API and what it's going to need to do, get everyone aligned. Uh, it's always really fun, a great activity. And, uh, and I talk in the book about, how to facilitate those kinds of discussions. So if you need to facilitate and you've never done it before, it gives you some hints there. And also a bit about how to manage it virtually since we're uh, more and more moving to a, a distributed virtual world where we don't have everyone in the same room anymore like we used to. So uh, that that's a, it's a great technique to be able to kind of expand or help to surface those job stories and those activities and steps. You know, um, especially listening to you now talk about it, uh, it really, one of the other things that Brandolini talks about, and I think you mentioned this in the book, but I, but I, I, I know we've discussed this idea before is Brandolini points out that often as arc systems architects, software architects, developers, tech leads, and so on and so forth, um, we're actually operating in a domain that we don't know really well. I might not know insurance really well when I'm trying to help a company uh, solve their problems, come up with job stories. So event storming and these other things are a way to kind of get us um, into the domain to get us to learn about their domain and learn the language, which is another key element of domain driven design as well. Right. So I love the way that you, you, you really, the way you use event storming and the way you use these job stories are really a way to elicit parts of the domain or the activities, uh, that sometimes I, I have a real challenge for when I'm trying to help someone. Um, so I, I think that's really, really, really handy. I think that probably I'm guessing here. I know you, you work with lots of different organizations to help them with their, with their software, with, with their enterprise and design. That must be a challenge for you, right? Is the sense that you're coming to a domain that, that maybe you, you haven't had a lot of experience in or a particular set of particulars that are new to you. Yeah. So my, my background is, is fairly diverse. I've, I've worked in a lot of different industries. I've worked in commercial insurance, banking, even helped a startup airline get off the ground, literally helping a, uh, an organ a, a, a new startup airline to while they were getting their pilot certified and their first plane certified wow. to fly from JFK to, to Stansted. They were, uh, you know, we were working on building, you know, their, their, all their infrastructure and tying into mainframe systems and other things in the airline industry. So as a result of working a lot of these different domains, it's forced me to have to learn a domain pretty quickly. So my career has been based on that. And a lot of the software, uh, uh, analysis and design techniques that were taught years ago that we've since kind of 
lost or, or kind of get mixed in with other techniques uh, have really come to, uh, to, to help me figure that out. And I've tried to bring that into the ADDR process as a result. But the other thing to keep in mind is just because you've been in an industry for a while doesn't necessarily mean you know that particular part of the organization. I was talking to someone right. who's, who uh, was working in commercial insurance for 18 years, and they have never been on the claim side of thing when someone needs to make a claim because of, you know, an auto accident or, or whatever else, you flood or whatever else, and they need to make that claim. They never worked in that part of the organization, so they really didn't understand how it worked. So even as someone who's been in, in the same organization or in that same vertical domain for, for almost two decades, they still need those techniques to understand how to break down a domain and think about it in new ways and get that knowledge transfer from other domain experts. So using those kinds of techniques like event storming and job stories and activity steps really help to ensure that everybody is on the same level playing field, using the same vocabulary, the same ubiquitous language as we would say in DDD terms. We all mean the same things when we're saying the same things. And that's really, really important and absolutely important for API design. Yeah, it, it reminds me of this old uh, saying attributed to uh, uh, Confucius. You know, someone asked Confucius, if you were the the uh, the king of the world, what's the first thing you would do? And he, he said, I would make names correspond to things, <laughs> which is the hardest part, yeah. right? When I say widget, is that the same widget you mean? And so on and so forth. So it's a huge part of this detailed process, right? And, and I think that's one of the things, you know, we've talked about the alignment with business and now we're really kind of talking about the, the defined part of your ADDR, this idea of finding all the details, the activities and the steps. One of the things I really love about your approach is, you know, at, still at this definition process for API design, you're not talking about HTTP post or get or put or GraphQL or anything. You're really still focused on the, all of the details, all the language, the ubiquitous language, you would say in domain design of all these elements that uh, that I think that's so, so critical in the process. So um, I think one of the other ones sort of jumping ahead. I mean, it, it, there are so many things we could talk about. One of the other ones that really stood out to me in the book was when you when you actually start talking about the, the life cycle of the API, you have this really nice, detailed life cycle process. One of the change management issues we deal with all the time is versioning, right? You can, I always say that if you want to start a, a nice fight in a room of, of tech geeks, just mention the word versioning and see what happens. You introduce, you, you describe in a book, uh, in the book, a really interesting difference between versioning and revisions, versions and revisions. And I wonder if you could sort of explain what that is, where that comes from and why that's so important. Uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, credit where credit's due. Uh, this is this really stems from the work at Microsoft. Daryl Miller shared this out some time ago. Microsoft was trying to figure out how do we manage versioning for our APIs that we onboard onto our own gateway inside of Azure. And they wanted some guidance and they wanted to define some terminology that would really be clear and understandable for people publishing an API and managing it with a gateway and determining, am I routing to the same set of instances of an API or, or am I routing to a whole new version? And, you know, what does that mean? So the way that they defined it and the way that I capture that in the book is that a, a revision is like a minor change. If we think of semantic versioning or Simver, uh, it's like a, a minor version. We're, we're making a change, but it shouldn't be breaking. We should have the same functionality. We're just adding an enhancement, um, you know, adding a new operation, or perhaps sending back something on our response that we weren't sending before, but people can, clients that are integrated with the previous revision could safely ignore. It's, it shouldn't break anyone. Uh, the revision gives us the freedom to make improvements to our API iteratively, as long as we don't break what's already there. So part of the ADDR process is aligning and defining our API uh, initially to understand what we need to do. But then as we move forward and start to design and deliver the API, we could chunk it into smaller chunks and iteratively deliver it. And we can take advantage of that revision semantic to, to support that. Now compare that to a version where those are like major versions in Simver. Those are, those are major versions that we're probably going to introduce breaking changes and they should be treated as separate products. Meaning if I have a customer on version one and I introduce version two, 
I really have to sell them and convince them to do the work necessary to migrate to version two. And that's a much bigger ask than the revision changing behind the scenes. And maybe they're not even aware of it, that we've added a new operation. We've improved something slightly, but we haven't broken that contract. Their code will continue to run and they don't need to ask someone to go fix something. Uh, so version and revision gives us two different elements of the life cycle, allowing us to be agile in how we approach our design, but also recognizing that there are times when we need to make a fundamental change and that we have to then start thinking about how do we own that change, how do we communicate that change, and how do we encourage people to migrate to that new version, spending the necessary money and time and effort to jump to that new version. So we have to think about what are the incentives and you know what are the what's the value? Not just the value it's providing to me because I got to change some back end framework, I got to clean up some code, <laughs> delete a bunch of lines of code that were unnecessary because I was able to create a slightly more efficient effective API design. Anyone that's using our API probably doesn't care about that and they don't want to spend the money to migrate to a new major version to 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 gather that up. So uh, that, that's, that's what I, uh, like to recommend for that life cycle aspect of API design. And it gives us the flexibility. It helps us from having to do a big bang design up front, but we want to do the investment to align and define where we're headed and then break that up and then learn and incorporate our feedback just like we normally would in our little a agile processes, no matter what framework or methodology you might be using, it allows us to do that while still recognizing that APIs are forever. And so we do have to kind of be very careful about how we approach our designs and making breaking changes. Yeah. And I think the things, the things that I take away when I was reading through that material and in hearing you talk uh, today too, is this notion that revisions are these minor changes that the service can choose, that the API producer or the API server can choose to make uh, as long as they're backward compatible. Um, but the, the, the major, the sem major, right? The, the sort of breaking change things, version one, version two, version three, these are, like you say, they're different products and, and uh, consumers make the choice, right? I'm going to choose when I go to version two, not you. So this idea of I can continue to make minor changes. If I make a major change, it's a new product. That's a great way. I really, I really love the way you talk about that in the sense that that's a new, that's a new thing on the shelf. That's a new product that, people need to deal with and they can choose classic Coke or they can choose new Coke or right? you, you, you know, you have to sell them on the idea of why it, why it's valuable to move on. I really, really love that idea because I think one of the things, and you touch on this uh, uh, later in the book, uh, one of the things that we deal with as, as designers, everybody who's a developer for APIs is it's not a monoculture, right? There are APIs that have been here for years. There are APIs that are in experiments. There are APIs that just got released. There are APIs that are going to be changed. And as you grow that ecosystem, if you have hundreds and hundreds of, of endpoints and you have the, you know, dozens and dozens of API packages, there's always going to be somebody at some new revision, somebody that might be thinking about a new version, somebody that is experimenting. It's a complex ecosystem, right? Uh, and then as you, uh, you've used, um, Werner Vogels, I think, is the person I attribute to the quote, APIs are forever, right? You've used that a handful of times. That's a real challenge. How do you, you know, how do you help people um, get a handle on the notion of that ecosystem, of that life cycle, that multi-varied uh, world that really everyone's dealing with? Yeah, there's a, there's a few techniques that I recommend. One is... Um making sure to communicate to your consumers what the expectations are. So if I'm standing up an API to see, you know, to experiment with something new, then marking it as experimental and making sure that people understand that this API might go away, as opposed to something that may be in pre-release and may have some design changes that may be forthcoming that could break their integrations. But for the most part, we're getting closer and, and it will be supported. And then a supported uh, 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 element that or a promise that says this API is in production, it's supported, and we're going to follow, you know, revisions and versions, and we're going to be very careful about how we change things. It's all right, also recognizing that sometimes we have to step back and take an inventory of what we have and making sure that we understand what APIs do we have today and how do they fit in the ecosystem. Uh, and, and then also just the idea of, of how we bundle our APIs. So sometimes we might have APIs that are very specific, you know, have a specific use and others that are more generic. So we have flexibility in how we bundle those things together so that we can really think about um, 
the productization of our APIs. We may have lots of internal APIs in a large organization. How are we going to bundle them and offer them as a cohesive product so that they can solve problems and, and work together to accomplish bigger and bigger things? So there's, there's different techniques and ways that you can do that so that you can approach, you know, using ADDR or just approach any kind of API initiative uh, from, from the perspective of, of recognizing that, that not everything's going to be greenfield. There are going to be existing APIs, and we need to work within those bounds, and we need to recognize where they're at, what they're doing, how they fit in the bigger ecosystem, and then what kind of promise are we giving to our consumers when we push it out the door or make it available to other developers inside our organization as well. You know, what, 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 how, how is it going to be supported and how are we going to be able to continue to leverage that? Or will we, could it go away tomorrow because, you know, we're just trying something out. So it gives us that flexibility that we need. Yeah. I mean, it sounds to me, this is another topic that is sort of an evergreen topic whenever I get uh, designers, architects together. And that is the topic of boundaries, of bounded context of, of where you draw the line. Hi, this, this endpoint belongs here. These endpoints belong over here. You know, you, how do you, you talk about this in the book. I mean, how do we approach this notion of API boundaries and why, why is it important, uh, to do that? Yeah. The, the boundaries allow us to really focus in on a, on a couple of things. One is the scope of the API. What, what is it designed to do or what it's, what are its responsibilities? And the other is, is ownership of the API. So if, if we know what the scope and responsibilities are, do we know who's going to own that API? A lot of organizations are producing a tremendous amount of APIs today, but a lot of them are being pushed out and then forgotten. And it's unfortunate because, you know, there's, there's opportunities to take advantage of a, of a product ownership life cycle of how do we not only just get that first version out, but how do we make it better? So being able to find our boundaries, determine who's going to own something, what's inside that bounded area of that API, not a bounded context from the DDD perspective, because that's that's a bit of a smaller boundary sometimes, but more more of the boundary of what the API is responsible for. Uh, that may reflect the way the organization operates or where the product is designed or, you know, groups of, of features or operations or particular areas of it. So there's a bit of nuance to it, but we use things like the activity steps and the event storming early on to help find those boundaries. And it gives us a starting point. Those may move, they may shift as we learn more, but it's really, really important. We don't want to have our APIs exhibiting those anti patterns of either being one operation per API and I have to hop around 20 different sets of documentation to figure out how to get something done. Or I have an API with 300 operations and I got to dig through this massive documentation to find that one <laughs> operation that I need to, to add to what I'm doing today. So we want to avoid a lot of those anti-patterns, use those boundaries to tackle and avoid those things and, and to really kind of reason about how our API lives and what, how, how does it fit in the overall ecosystem of APIs? How is it going to be owned? How is it going to be supported? And, you know, what other APIs and other bounded areas might complement it without overwhelming that consumer? And that also kind of goes to that bundling idea I mentioned before of, you know, we might be bundling different portions of an API together into different product offerings to meet the needs of different personas or market segments or, you know, what, whatever our target audience uh, is. Yeah, I think, I think that's another thing that, that comes to mind just in general, uh, you know, in my experience as well is uh, this, uh, this, we're seeing more and more of this composability happen, right? Where people want to use, well, I want to use this user management API and this payment API and the shipping API and our product API. We're composing all those APIs together into something. And all of a sudden that composability, now boundaries are really important. Right. Because I have to sort of ship. I have to pick everything up and sort of hoist it over the boundary if I'm going to send it to payments. Right. And then I have to get, take certain information and hoist it into the customer experience, the user management side, authorize your accounts. So we become really um, focused on boundaries. In fact, I don't know if this has been your experience, but I think I'm seeing more and more questions about boundaries over the last couple of years than I have ever before. You know, I used to hear lots of questions about what is an API and why and how do I design one and so on and so forth. Now I'm getting a lot more of this, you know, where do the lines cross? Where do they meet? How do I, how do I compose well? I wonder if that, if, if you've had that experience at all or if that's shaped anything about, you know, the way, the way you've talked about boundaries now, this idea of composability. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's shaping a lot of where, where I came from in this book and, and just generally when I'm working with organizations. 
Uh, the idea of microservices have shifted and brought this this to light now because we're not building you know multiple big monolithic systems that we can just slap one API onto that has everything. We're building a lot of smaller services. We're using techniques like Lambda and serverless functions and other kinds of techniques to break things into smaller uh, composable components that may have APIs. And those component APIs are oftentimes a bit different than a productized API that we would share outside the organization. So these productized APIs are the things that represent the front door to your organization or the front door to a particular aspect of your organization, a particular line of business, business unit, domain area. Uh, and so composable organizations are starting to leverage microservices, but there's a bit in the middle that we have to think about. And it's that packaging and bundling, like I mentioned earlier, of how we take these more component-oriented APIs or these back-end APIs that are uh, does, they're decomposed because of the way we're designing a system or the way that we have, as Conway's law would say, you know, bringing in some of the organizational structure and the way that we have our, our people organized and the way that our processes are organized and, and, and you know, are conducted. So we have to really kind of separate those two concerns out. And the ADDR process really wants to focus in on the product APIs first or the, the bundling of those. Some, for some big organizations, they might think of them as platform APIs, those APIs that are uh, representative of different areas of the organization that could be combined and recombined together to produce different outcomes. So if we think about uh, the boundaries and and, and what we're looking at, what we often have is we have these little bounded areas that someone's responsible for, for a microservice, a, a, a coarse grain service, or, you know, kind of a semi-coarse grain service uh, from the old SOA days or, or whatever it else it is. You're going to have a mixture of those, uh, you know, grain levels of granularity. Uh, but, but they're oftentimes owned by one team, and that team is, doesn't really understand how to bundle that in a product or what the external needs are. They just know that they need some function as a service to extract some data out, event on something, react to an event, something like that. That's at a different level of granularity. So boundaries are really, really important. And we're having more discussions because of the more distributed nature of today's software architecture. And it's requiring us to think about APIs at different levels, to rethink what APIs really are and the different levels or types of APIs and how they might be used and combined and packaged and, and bundled. Yeah, I really, I, I totally agree. I, I sort of think of it almost, I don't know if I think of it as a maturity or as somewhere along the path where, you know, we're sort of beyond the basics. Now we're really thinking about the composable elements, the units, the interactions between them. So it's very exciting. It's, it's a very exciting time. One of the other things, talking about this notion of, you know, beyond the basics and composability, another thing that's through the book, which I really love, is you talk about the difference between modeling an API and designing an API. This idea that these, that modeling is this still this sort of non-specific tech, but sort of coming up with these basic pieces and then actually selecting technology to actually design an API that implements this thing. What, you know, can you, can you sort of expand on that? Do I have that idea, right? The difference between modeling and designing and, and how that, how that kind of plays out in your experience. Yeah, definitely, Mike. Uh, there's definitely a difference between modeling and design. Modeling helps us to focus on what the API needs to do independent of the API style that's used. So we want to use the API profile to capture the digital capabilities and the operations that that API will provide. Then we can model, take our model and use that to design our API. So we may start with a REST-based API or GraphQL or gRPC. And we can use that model then to translate the operations that we've identified that help us with the jobs to be done and the desired outcomes into that API style of choice. So it gives us the opportunity to separate out the implementation details from the idea of how we're going to design our API uh, away from what the API really just needs to do, the accomplishments that, or the uh, outcomes that it needs to offer. So there is definitely some value there in making sure that we have a profile that we can then leverage and, and use to translate into the API design. Yeah, I think so. So this really kind of comes back to the things we were talking about earlier, how you say a, a team wants to know that the API they're defining is really the one that's needed. Like by focusing on this model, 
I love that you get a sort of a, a kind of a North Star, however you want to think about it, a North Star or a foundational, you know, pillar, which is the modeling. And then you can solve specific problems. You know, we're going to do it like this with GraphQL or we're going to do it like this with gRPC. Or you can go back to the well uh, uh, previously. And and I loved the way you talk about it in the book also uh, is this idea that it is still iterative. Each one of these, you can iterate on the model, you can iterate on the design, you can iterate on steps and activities, which I find really, really liberating for that sort of, like you said, you know, small a agile Kind of, kind of approach to things. Um, there's, a, there's a quote that, that I've used in, in relation to some of this before. It's, it's from Frank Lloyd Wright. It's from an actual, you know, physical architect, you know, and he says, you, you know, you can use an eraser on the drawing table or a sledgehammer on the construction site, right? And I love that you have all of these elements before I kind of commit to a working version. I have all of these places where I can use my eraser, where I can improve and iterate and compare. Uh, before I get there. So that's a, that's a really, 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 really cool feature. Um, now you talked about styles. So you actually, this is another thing that I find uh, makes your book very unique. You actually talk about the same model in various styles, don't you, uh, throughout the book? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like to use the same model multiple ways. Uh, once we have the model defined, with the capabilities that the API needs to deliver, we can then start to look at opportunities for delivering multiple API styles for the same API. So we can, I found it very common to have uh, APIs start off with REST. That's the most common style and the most comfortable for most developers, but they may expand and integrate in a GraphQL query to support ad hoc queries or response shaping or other things. We may also look at async APIs as well. So how can we offer web sockets or webhooks or other mechanisms to incorporate as well? So we start with that API profile, then we allow those designs to emerge as they're needed. So spend time listening and understanding to uh, your API developers, the consumers that are going to be using your API, and listen and see if there's new styles you need to incorporate. You can always go back to the API profile, use that as a foundation, and start to design using different API styles. I, yeah, and I love that section of the book. It's so uh, sort of empowering. It's so enlightening to to see that sort of design approach for you know each of these styles with the same sort of like backing material. I, I love I love that idea. You know, one of the other things I'm just going to mention, there's so many things, but I want to, I want to talk about this one other item that you talk about in the book, um, that really struck me. Uh, and that is when you talk about sort of refining the design, like past the implementation details, you talk about testing and you talk about, uh, documentation and all that. You talk, a, you spend a good deal of time on this idea of a portal of an API portal. You don't just talk about designing the API and implementing the API. You talk about the collection of APIs. So can you, can you kind of, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but I mean, you spent a lot of time on this idea. You've even designed a kind of a minimum portal framework, right? Yeah. So I worked with a technical writer, Hillary. She and I sat down and started to ask ourselves what parts of the portal are absolutely essential when you're launching a new API. Whether it's one API is part of a whole, a part of a bigger bundle, and we just need to think about the documentation that's needed to support that particular API as part of the whole, or if you're launching a full API product, it can be overwhelming to deliver documentation uh, in that way, you know, like a full portal from day one. So we wanted to think about what's needed. It's important to realize that things like Open API spec for REST APIs, as well as IDL and SDL for gRPC and GraphQL, they only provide reference documentation, how to use each operation, but they don't tell you how to complete the entire workflow. So when you think about an API and what it's trying to do and the outcomes it's delivering, which we again talked about during the align phase with job stories and the jobs to be done, there's oftentimes more than one operation that needs to be used and they need to be coordinated or orchestrated in some way. So we need things like getting started documentation and other kinds of documentation as part of the overall API offering. So the minimum viable portal starts to look at how do we tackle that documentation effectively in an iterative fashion so that we can continue to deliver on that little a agile 
type of approach when we deliver our API and not do a big bang delivery of everything all at once. So that's what the minimum viable portal is about. And it's part of that refine phase. How do we go from just the API design to the documentation to really uh, delivering robust documentation for the API consumer that's going to be integrating it into their solution? So if we started to look at the MVP and start to think about what our consumers really need to get things done, it's also helpful during that refine phase to capture, say, like a static mock or a readme mock that details how to go through step by step. And that allows us to make sure that, one, we can validate that we have all the operations we need in our API, as well as it starts to contribute to that getting started guide that we mentioned earlier that should be part of that initial MVP of your portal. So being able to make sure that you have sufficient documentation and that you validated that design that you have to meet the needs and deliver those outcomes is really important. So using readme style documentation where we iterate step by step or demonstrate step by step how to use the API with multiple API operation calls, request response interactions will go a really long way. Right. You know, that, that, that's the way I use sequence diagrams, actually, the same way you just described, which is, yes, I know you have, you have a series of endpoints and I can pass this in and get that. Why would I do that? How do I use this collection to compose a solution? And if I'm missing something, I, I can, if I can do the sequence and I realize, well, there, and magic happens here. Well, I guess I need another endpoint or I need something else here. So I, I love that. I love that aspect of it as well. And, uh, yeah, there are just so many things we, we can really talk about, but I know we're running short on time. What are, I mean, what are your final thoughts? You've worked with this book now, uh, with this material for several years. The book has, has been out for quite a while. What would you leave, uh, uh, listeners with, uh, to make sure they go forward? Like you, you say, you know, towards the end of the book, this is only the beginning, right? But what does that really mean? One thing to keep in mind is that when we design an API, we don't just design it once and then walk away from it. It's a living, breathing product, just like anything else we need to manage. So first off, we need to recognize that we're going to use the ADDR process over and over again as we discover new needs or new opportunities for our API. So that's the first thing. The other is to keep in mind that, and I want to leave the audience with this, that uh, our, our APIs, they're about communication. The documentation communicates with the developer to tell you how to use it to get things done. And the API underneath the covers is really a communication mechanism for the end user through whatever interface that they're using to talk to some backend system or service or, or a combination of systems and services. So remember that our APIs are really products. They need to be nurtured and developed and expanded over time. And if we keep that in mind, then we'll be able to go back and leverage our ADDR expertise and use that over and over again as we learn and refine our API over time, gain more feedback and want to add more to it. I love that. You know, I don't think I can improve on that. We'll leave it at that. It's James Higginbotham. The book is Principles of Web API Design. I love the book. I highly recommend it to everyone. And now people can pick up the book. You also have a newsletter. Isn't that right, James? I, I do. I have a newsletter where I hand curate API related content each week. Uh, so go to apideveloperweekly.com. You can sign up for that. It just comes out once a week. And uh, there's always some interesting articles, whether they're technical in nature or more business oriented. Sometimes I have things that are tangentially related in some ways. And uh, it's, it's there for everybody. REST, GraphQL, gRPC, API security, API design, consuming APIs, code examples, all kinds of different things that I link to. And uh, if, if you're listening and you might have an article you want to submit, feel free to uh, sign up for the newsletter. And and there's details about how you can contribute as well. And we can find you, there'll be links, and we can find you on, on Twitter, right? Is Launch Any, is that right? Yes, yeah. Launch Any on Twitter, and yeah. launchany.com is the website for my business for consulting and training. Excellent. Thank you very much, James. It's great to talk with you, and I look forward to the next time we get together. Thanks, Mike. Great talking with you as well. Look forward to next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.